the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. Hey all, and welcome back to the show and to the conclusion of the Stardust Ranch saga. Thank you for bearing with me the past few weeks. My schedule just got way too out of hand and busy getting prepped for Monster Fest, and then the return home, decompressing after the trip and having a whole bunch of life stuff that had to happen, house projects that needed to get done. My intention originally was to have this episode released last week, but I just ran into too many things. There was too big of a time crunch. (laughs) So thank you again for bearing with me and for waiting. This episode is going to be worth the wait, I think, and you're going to love it. And of course, over the last two weeks, while I've been super busy, we've had all this wild stuff happening in the UFO world with this whistleblower that came out about a super secret UFO UAP crash retrieval program. And then there's this story that seems to be still developing about aliens landing in Las Vegas that's all over social media and in the internet in general. So Lots of catching up to do <laughs> beyond just doing this episode and trying to get it all all done for y'all. But before I get started, I just wanted to give a quick recap of Monster Fest. This event was a huge success, and I want to give a big shout out and huge thanks to all of the folks with Small Town Monsters, A, for hosting the event, and B, for having me. It was super fun. Got to see a lot of people. I'm going to have to have some of the Small Town Monsters crew on the show at some point. I've been meaning to uh, schedule some stuff. But the uh, the trip itself wasn't too bad. I managed to stock up on new merch just a few days before I had to head out. Thankfully, the weather was nice. I wound up leaving early Friday morning before the event and rolled into Canton, Ohio around... 6 p.m. or so. And then I spent the next two and a half hours setting up (laughs) the side of the room that I was in was a really solid crew of people that I knew, which was nice. I was right next to Coco Van Boxtel from Strange Little Lands, Holly Houlihan, who's a great cryptid artist, Lisa from Cryptid Comforts, Liz from Keep On Creeping On, Jonathan Dodd, Easton Hawk, Danner from Conjure Dust Designs, who thankfully made it to the show, although his car didn't. He wound up getting rear-ended, which really was no good, but he's okay, and that's awesome. And who else was there? There was the Moth Boys. Max Lim from Maximus Prime Art was there. He was out in the uh, sponsor's hall, which was really hot, and I didn't go out there too often. (laughs) But it was good to see a massive representation of the cryptid crew that I've come to know and love and I miss everyone already so we'll see each other again soon unfortunately I won't be able to do any of the other shows really except for one so after setting up I did a little bit of hanging out after but the hotel restaurant closed at 9 p.m. so by the time I was done setting up and I made it down there I had to DoorDash some dinner, but uh, Aaron Deese, who's been on the show before, was there hanging out. He just authored a book about the Dogman Triangle in Texas, so I'm going to be having him come on the show soon to talk about that. Small Town Monsters' new publishing part of their business actually put the book out, which is really awesome. I also got to see Jeremiah from Bigfoot Society, Asher's from On Wednesdays We Talk Weird 
who else was there? Uh, Jesse and Joe from Hellbent Holler, who were recently on the show. Super awesome folks. Lyle Blackburn was there. Stan Gordon, Cliff Berrickman, Mike Ann from Tactical Bigfoot Research and Where's My Sage podcast. I got to meet Shannon LeGro from Into the Fray. Eli Watson and Alex Petikoff were there. Just a whole host of rad people that make things happen within this community. And I urge all of you to check out all these folks, podcasts and projects and all the stuff that they do. It's a really, really awesome community. And then the day of the event was just wild and nonstop busy. I get to have some really cool and interesting conversations with a few people. I got to meet a few Patreon members from my Patreon that I haven't met in person before. So shout out to Angie and Megan for coming out to the show and stopping by and saying hello. So yeah, it was a a great time. And if Small Town Monsters does it again, I'll definitely be signing up. So you'll see me next time if they do it. I'm sure they will. (laughs) And I'm sure like, yeah, okay. You're all like, get into the episode already. We want to hear about Stardust Ranch. But one last thing, just a quick reminder that the only other event that I am going to be doing this year is the Sasquatch Calling Festival, which happens in Whitehall, New York on September 30th. It's in the Skeensboro Waterfront Park, and it's an all-day event. It's like this big craft fair. People are selling Bigfoot stuff and all sorts of other things. And the day ends with a Sasquatch calling contest. So if you're in the area, definitely come out, find my tent, say hello. And that's it. All right. So here is the conclusion of the story of Stardust Ranch. So buckle up. All right, so it's been a minute since the last episode, of course, so I'm just going to give a brief recap of what's happened so far. And if you haven't listened to part one of this, do yourself a favor and go back and listen to that first. So the Edmonds purchased Stardust Ranch back in 1996, and from the day they moved in, they started experiencing all sorts of high strangeness from all the home belongings still being there and then literally everything in the house being put in the in-ground pool in the backyard, the man with the machete showing up, UFOs in the skies above the ranch, along with light orbs closer to the ground and on the property itself. And then came the animal mutilations of John's favorite dog and some of the best horses that they had. And the manner in which they were killed seemed to defy all logic and explanation, like being completely exsanguinated with no trace of blood around, or the animal corpses being flattened like pancakes. And then the phenomena came for John and Joyce Edmonds themselves in the form of doppelganger encounters, strange marks, cuts, and bruises on their bodies. And it all came to a head with John waking up to C3 gray aliens next to his bed in the middle of the night, which led to years of battling with these things, only to find out that the only way to take them out was by cutting their heads off with a samurai sword. And that's where I left off with part one. Now, allegedly, John has the decapitated body and head of this alien that he went samurai jack on, so now what? Well, John had gotten in touch with a retired Air Force officer named Captain Robert Collins. Collins had appeared numerous times on Coast to Coast AM, and he left the armed forces to actually pursue a uh, career in researching UFOs and the alien phenomena. Collins was enthralled by John's story about Stardust Ranch and was familiar with Similar locations like Bradshaw Ranch and Skinwalker Ranch. Collins had gotten John connected with other people in the UFO community as well to help get his story out to the public. One of whom was a man named Peter Gersten, who John became very well acquainted with and actually became very active within his non-profit UFO website, CA. U.S., which stands for Citizens Against UFO Secrecy. Now, as of 2023, 
CAUS is apparently inactive now. But while it was still active in the early to mid 2000s, John started to write blog articles about his experiences there, which started to put a lot of eyes on the ranch. John would get random phone calls from psychics trying to tell him what was going on there or people just wanting information about his property. Now, at this point in time, it was after John had the experience of seeing Joyce floating down the hallway and through the wall and out towards this flying saucer that was trying to tractor beam Joyce up into it in the middle of the night. And he pulls out his AK-47 and empties a banana clip into it. For a time, the alien activities seemed to stop after that, although the usual weird stuff kept happening like the missing objects phenomenon and other strange shadow people and poltergeist type activity. There were these other strange shadow like entities that John explained would start to appear around this time that he could see out in the desert beyond the edge of the property one of which he called a Michelin man because to him it looked like the Michelin mascot, which is supposed to be like stacked tires and it's white and kind of looks like a bunch of marshmallows stacked together, kind of like the Stave Puffed Marshmallow Man, but not quite like Ghostbusters, right? Except it's in a humanoid form. So... One early evening, John was outside doing some chores in the horse stables, and it was still light enough to see out beyond the ranch, and he said he could see this Michelin Man entity walking with a gait like Bigfoot from the Patterson-Gimlin film. Just think about that, the way it's walking, how Patty is just kind of lumbering along, and it's just walking around out in the desert wilderness. To him, it looked humanoid, but according to John, it it wasn't a person. It was something else, clearly. And after that first sighting, it started to become a regular occurrence. It would appear again and again, usually inching closer and closer each time it would appear. On one occasion, it actually came onto the property and started to get really close to the house and john decided to go grab his ak-47 and he shot a few rounds at it but it was completely unfazed and kept doing its thing and since he finally got to see it up close he described it as looking like it was made of brillo pads which in later interviews where he talks about this john referred to them as brillo men as opposed to michelin men Maybe there was a, a copyright issue <laughs> or maybe it was just a better or more accurate description of, of what these things supposedly looked like. So John spends a lot of time posting on the CAUS blog and then is also getting to the point of being interviewed on Coast to Coast and his notoriety is growing. One day in 2008, he was having a beer with a neighbor and giving him some tips on cleaning guns and properly maintaining them. And out of nowhere, this black SUV pulls up to the ranch gate. The vehicle stops and the engine turns off and the two front doors open up and two men dressed in black suits get out of the vehicle. They were of average height and strangely, they walked in this weird kind of unison, shoulder to shoulder and towards the closed ranch gate. The two men then walked through the gate like it wasn't even there. And at this point, John has experienced all manner of weird stuff on the ranch from poltergeist activity to animal mutilations and alien abduction. So he's used to all sorts of weird crap happening, right? But this site definitely made him shocked. He was taken aback. And meanwhile, his neighbor is standing there speechless at, at what he just witnessed. I would be too, right? <laughs> the neighbor wasn't ignorant to the goings on at the ranch. John had filled him in on some stuff here and there, but I assume he wasn't a regular visitor and hadn't ever seen or experienced anything strange there anytime he went by for a visit. And this was the first time John had a run-in with something like this. And of course, it's the men in black. 
And the two of them walk right within six feet of John. And he noticed that there was something really uncanny valley about them. The faces didn't look right. He described their skin as looking like uncooked chicken that was pale and lifeless. How's that for a descriptor? (laughs) And John opens up the dialogue asking if there's anything that he can do to help them and what they want. One of the MIBs then steps right into John's face like a foot away. And he says, you're John Edmonds and you're going to stop publishing articles on Peter Gersten's CAUS website. And naturally, John was like, the hell I am, excuse me. And this MIB then says the same thing again, like a broken record. You're John Edmonds, and you're going to stop publishing articles on Peter Gerson's CADUS website. Both of the MIBs then do an about face, say nothing else, and they walk back to the black SUV that's parked out on the road. And they again phase right through the iron barred gate at the property entrance like they were smoke (laughs) essentially they get in their vehicle and then drive off now i've done a whole episode about the men in black so if you haven't checked that one out yet definitely go back through my catalog and give it a listen pretty much all accounts of encounters with the men in black describe them as wearing these black suits and sometimes a fedora and not looking quite human there's always something off about them and they typically come in pairs and there was this one witness story that says the mibs that they were dealing with that stopped by their place looked sickly pale and they seemed to have on makeup and like lipstick to make them appear more human and lifelike and not quite like a a dead corpse (laughs) and It kind of suggests that they could be maybe some kind of android or something like that, I think. But the mannerisms are always off. They don't quite know how to behave correctly, and their speech is almost robotic. So what John describes here in his experience seems to hit all the marks for a classic MIB encounter. And after this, John did take some time off from posting on Gersten's website because he was so shook by this encounter. Later on, he did start to resume posting, but for a time, it sounds like he was trying to play it safe. Okay, so you're probably wondering what's up with the alien body. (laughs) I wanted to backtrack a little bit as I left the Men in Black part out of the previous episode, and I just wanted to include it so we can see that John's story is getting out in the world and now he's facing potential threats from the men in black or some clandestine organization or something that's out there. And so he has this alien body in his meat freezer and he's wondering what he's going to (laughs) do. So he reaches out to Captain Collins this former Air Force officer. He hadn't spoken with him in some time as he went silent after taking a break from posting on Gersten's website. So after he slices and dices this gray alien, he calls up Collins for advice on what to do. And as it turns out, Collins knew a biophysicist up in Michigan and thought the best course of action would be was to get tissue samples up to this guy as soon as possible. The, this biophysicist was named William C. Levengood, or he's also referred to as W.C. Levengood. And Levengood was a through-and-through through scientist. He had authored over 50 peer-reviewed papers in scientific journals and publications. And while Levengood was solidly into the physics and chemistry of biology, he was also a researcher into the strange and unexplained, namely crop circles. After watching a TV special about them in 1990, he decided that he was going to start to conduct research on plant samples from where crop circles were happening. It was something that really intrigued him. And I'll have to do an episode about crop circles at some point, but if you haven't heard of them or don't know what they are, they're basically a phenomena that 
has been happening globally for years, where in fields of wheat or other crops, formations will appear overnight and farmers will get up the next morning to see this huge section of their crops just flattened. Sometimes they're simple circles, hence the name, but many times they're also complex and geometric, sometimes seemingly containing a message. And there's accounts going back to at least the 1600s. There's this early newspaper article about the mowing devil in England that you can find where something unexplained was flattening farmers' crops. There's even accounts that date back a thousand years before that, which is pretty wild. And at the time, it was attributed to something like demons or the devil or something paranormal or supernatural. And the epicenter for crop circles in the modern day and how they gained widespread attention was in England in the 80s and 90s, where tons of these things were popping up overnight. Eventually, however, in the early 90s, two men came forward and claimed to be behind them. Now, sure, some are man-made, but there are ones that are unexplained and some so intricate without any trace of human activity to be done in a single night. Like, yes, there's these two guys put the word out there that, oh yeah, we're making crop circles and sure there's going to be copycats all over England and probably elsewhere, I would imagine, but the sheer amount of them and the complexity of them, you know, calls into question some of these can't be made by people. Some think that real crop circles could be made by some unknown force like earth energies or UFOs, which are the popular ideas. And it's interesting when you look at those cases, the plants in those situations are actually bent over without breaking, like the chemical and physical structure of the plant itself has changed and will continue to grow. Whereas in a crop circle that's made by people, the stalks of the plants will actually snap and kill the plants. So there's a clear distinction on a real and a fake crop circle. And moreover, people who visit crop circles that are legit claim to feel certain energies in them. Certain electronic equipment also has been known to malfunction. There's sometimes traces of radiation and even these microscopic metallic particles that are left behind on the plants that don't apparently occur naturally. It's really quite an interesting phenomenon. I'm sure I could go much more in depth with it, but let's get back to uh, Levengood here. So Levengood got in touch with John and he was super eager to take a look at these alleged alien tissue samples. And he made a whole list of all the parts and pieces that he, he wanted to be sent up to Michigan via FedEx. And Levengood apparently received the samples and spent time analyzing them. After some time, Levengood then gets back to John, and he states that the blood samples that were sent appeared to be pure hemoglobin, like similar to what's been found at various cattle mutilation sites over the world for decades. And there's also these segmented fibers that he was finding in the tissue samples and the blood that was sent that looked like grass or plant matter, but it wasn't plant material. It was something else entirely that he apparently could could not identify. Now, at this point in the story, John had resumed going on to Coast to Coast AM, talking about his story all over the internet when he could, and the presence of the Greys also apparently resumed along with new attempts at abducting the Edmonds. They would get strange marks showing up again on their bodies, which probably meant that there were abductions happening and they may not have remembered them due to some kind of memory block or screen memory put into their heads. And their horses and other animals also started to get targeted here and there as well. One of the interviews that I listened to, uh, just a funny little sidebar here, was that the Edmonds had a couple of pet cats i believe they were bengal cats and he claimed that the grays did not like the cats and they were actually afraid of the cats and never really wanted to mess with them for some reason which like 
okay, you're going to mess with like a thousand pound animal, like a horse <laughs> or a, uh, a dog that can be super aggressive, but not a cat. It's kind of interesting. So anyway, Levin Good was doing this back and forth with John, along with a few other people during his analysis through email. And in his final email to John in 2011, he pretty much said that this is the smoking gun proof of extraterrestrial contact and visitation to Earth. These samples are basically proof and links all sorts of other unknown phenomena in the realm of high strangeness. They didn't, however, send any samples to be DNA tested, I guess, as it would be too cost prohibitive to do so. But regardless, it seems that a press release on the findings would need to happen. Levengood said that he was very excited about this whole thing, but for some reason he didn't want to, couldn't, wouldn't, I'm not sure, <laughs> didn't want to write a proper press release. Instead, John responded to Levengood saying that he wanted to handle all of that, and that seems fair enough since it was from his property and his actions that led to these findings, right? And after this email was sent out, it was radio silence. John didn't hear a word from Levingood in quite a while, and he started to wonder perhaps word had got out of what they were testing and that Levingood maybe was silenced by some higher power or agency that didn't want this information becoming public. So after a while, one of the guys that John Edmonds was also corresponding with, besides Captain Collins, was this other guy, Daryl Sims, who is this self-purported alien hunter. Sims had also been trying to get in touch with Levengood to get things back on track and even flew out to Michigan to see what was going on with him. And this is when he found out that Levengood had actually passed away. He was 88 years old when he died, so it was likely natural causes, but John couldn't help shake the feeling that maybe something else had gone down. So, the whole thing became a bit of a dead end with no further extrapolation of the data or testing, it seems. And there's also rumors that Levin Good's lab burned down and the samples were destroyed or mysteriously disappeared, which is, of course, convenient. All right. So at this point, you're probably like, OK, John Edmonds has made all these claims. Where is the video or photographic evidence? And why haven't the Edmonds moved out? It's super convenient that this scientist guy who studied crop circles died and that his samples got erased somehow. <laughs> like, I agree that the lack of photographic and video evidence makes the whole story a little suspicious. Like, why not be constantly taking pictures of the strange things going on there? Well, there are actually some photos up on John Edmonds' old Facebook page of weird lights around the ranch, photos of some of the unexplained marks and bruises and scars that he claims were done by the Greys. I'm not sure if those are legit or if they're just normal wear and tear on the body from years of working on the ranch and other things. There are some blurry photos that look like a close-up of a gray alien face when you Google Stardust Ranch, but that kind of looks super fake, and I'm not sure of the origin of that particular image. It looks like it was some kind of sculpture or toy that was photoshopped. And there's also these photos of a weird rock that was supposedly found on the property after an encounter and battle with the grays. It basically has the center of it carved out, with this kind of sun-like or starburst-type shape in the middle. John claimed that the stone was analyzed, and whoever analyzed it said it would be near impossible to create it due to it being perfectly in the center of the stone and the carve-out in the middle being slightly tapered. I don't know about that. I, I don't carve stone, but I feel like something like this stone, and I'll put a picture, a link to the picture of it, in the show notes, but I would think that something like a high powered water jet carving tool could do this, but who knows? 
you would think that with all that happened, they might have invested in some security cameras and other monitoring equipment, especially with a horse rescue business. But then again, if they're dealing with super advanced otherworldly beings, maybe it wouldn't even matter. Like the aliens could probably just shut everything off anyway. You hear stories about how aliens show up at nuclear missile silos and shut things off there. So I would think a, a security camera system would probably not do much. <laughs> now, as far as selling the property, records show that the Edmonds listed the ranch for sale in 2014 for a price tag of $1.7 million. John has also said in interviews that he they were originally tried selling the ranch all the way back in 2004 for a much cheaper price and that he was contacted by somebody i believe it was in the government saying that they were selling for 20 times less than what they should be selling for since their property sits above one of the largest aquifers in arizona nobody bought in 2004 of course or in 2014. The following year, in 2015, they listed it again for 1.5 million and then changed the price back up to 1.7. And then in 2016, they tried selling it again, upping the price tag to 2.5 million. And then in 2017, the price went even higher. It doubled up to 5 million. And this was after the ranch was featured on ghost adventures now before i get into talking about the ghost adventures episode i do want to point out that a lot of people think that perhaps all of this story and the book that i've been referencing throughout all of this didn't come out until 2019 but a lot of people think that this may have just been something to jack up the property value as part of a big real estate scam or that John Edmonds wanted this place to be the next Skinwalker Ranch. This could be, but there are a few more interesting parts of the story to look at before we can draw any final conclusions, I think. And it is also worth mentioning, speaking of Skinwalker Ranch, that Robert Bigelow, the former owner of Skinwalker Ranch before Brandon Fugel took over in 2016, I think it was, did take an interest in purchasing Stardust Ranch from John and Joyce, and apparently put in... A few offers over the years, but ultimately backed away from buying the property altogether. So in 2016, Zach Baggins and his crew rolled up on Stardust Ranch to film an episode and do an investigation there. I believe it's season 12, episode 12. And so the, the show starts out with them interviewing John and Joyce, and they want to find out what's been going on and do the setup for the evening one of the team members winds up wanting to go out into the hills in the desert and is just left with a camera to record himself he doesn't have a cell phone or anything to contact the rest of the crew they basically just dump this guy in the desert and he's hoping to potentially see a ufo or get abducted by aliens i'm not sure why they didn't do it closer to the ranch or just have him set up in the back of the property where John Edmonds claims to have seen the, the Brillo man and other shadow like entities and light orbs and that kind of thing. And yeah, like the grays are supposedly all, all over the place too with their portals. Maybe this guy could have gone in the horse stables since that's where the horses were getting mutilated in their stalls overnight seems like a missed opportunity <laughs> but the investigation inside the house was pretty interesting and it seems like they actually caught some kind of weird shadow form on the night vision cameras that they had set up in the in the living room and they also got this interesting evp that sounded like it was saying whatever the entity was they were asking like who who are we talking to who are we communicating with where are you from they were saying that they were from above, which I would assume means outer space. Who knows? If these are like trickster-like entities, maybe they're just trying to throw people off. But Zach Baggins also seemed to lean towards this force being more demonic than 
alien, which was interesting. Overall, it seemed like it was kind of an uneventful, lackluster episode, to be honest. Uh, and despite it, it being produced for TV, which you always need to take with a grain of salt, of course. If the EVP and the shadow form they caught on camera were legit, it definitely makes it a little bit more credible that something out of the ordinary is happening on this property, which is something to note. And probably the only piece of video evidence that I'm at least aware of beyond the ghost adventures stuff happened during this interview that John did with Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. John is set up in the interview with his laptop in one of the rooms in the house. It's hard to tell exactly where he is. He might be in like a hallway or something. There's this pass through that you can see to his left. Like you can walk by, go around a corner into another room in the house. Maybe it's the living room or it goes into the kitchen or something. It's not an actual like door frame. It's just kind of a wall that turns into another room. It's honestly hard to tell. But anyway, I'll find the link and put it in the show notes so you can see for yourself. At one point during the interview, I think it's between like 15 to 18 minutes in, you can start to see this shape or figure peeking around the wall that's behind John. And you can't tell what it is. It could be a cat. It could be Joyce or someone else. But people are claiming that this could be one of the gray aliens that's popping in and watching John. And it actually shows up in two different instances, a few minutes apart. And there's one point during the interview, like John's not home alone because Joyce walks by and goes through this pass through and around the corner where this weird figure thing is bouncing around. And there's even someone else in the house too. There's a man that walks by in the background. So apparently John is wholly unaware of this weird <laughs> this weird activity behind him and Carrie Cassidy didn't notice until after the interview was posted to Project Camelot's website a few days later and people started pointing out that there's something going on in this video like perhaps it's possible that an ET was trying to phase in through a portal ultimately it's impossible to tell for certain it is an interesting video though so definitely check it out I would think if it was the Greys, you know, after John realized they were there, according to his story, and he was starting to fight them, that they didn't really care if they were seen around the house. The only time they they were hesitant is if they got noticed coming through the portals that they would open up. So who knows? <laughs> All right. Now, there is another part of the story here that I want to get into. It's kind of interesting. So there came a point during the Edmonds ownership of the ranch where they opened it up for people to come and stay and potentially experience some of the high strangeness that they had been experiencing ever since they moved in. And I can't remember if I mentioned it in the last episode, but by this point, John claimed to have killed up to 18 gray aliens by chopping their heads off essentially with the samurai sword. It's like, what did he do with all the bodies? The ones that he like shot and stuff would just phase out. But the ones that he chopped the heads off, he said didn't actually disappear. So it's unclear if maybe they disappeared after a while, like a video game or what he did with the bodies, but it didn't deter people from wanting to indulge their curiosity who heard about the place. So I'll get into one little story about that in just a minute. But in July of 2011, John received a call from this doctor uh, by the name of Brandy Howie, who had 30 years of experience in naturopathic, alternative and integrative medicine and healing. Dr. Howie had called John wanting to schedule a visit to the ranch and in this, in the book, John describes that Dr. Howie was on the payroll of someone that he knew named Cynthia T. Crawford, who, as, as a sidebar, her father was apparently a member of the OSS, which is the precursor to the CIA. 
Cynthia Crawford was someone who claimed to have been part of this super secret human alien hybrid biological engineering program that had been going on since World War II. And she claimed to have experienced abductions and all sorts of other high strangeness her whole life. And she was apparently the one who told Dr. Howie, who was on her payroll, I guess, that she should visit the ranch because the Edmonds were under constant attack from this band of renegade aliens. And unfortunately, a few years later in 2017, Cynthia passed away due to cancer. But as it turns out, Dr. Howie was also an experiencer of her whole life and had been subject to abduction by alien forces, or so she claims, since she was about four years old. And part of her practice with energy healing was being able to confront negative extraterrestrials. She was kind of like an exorcist, but for aliens instead of demons. And I know there are people who wholeheartedly believe that aliens are actually demons, but are they? I'm not so sure. So according to this part of the story, Dr. Howie went out to the ranch with some colleagues who were apparently both named Jay, who were actually warriors from the Sirius star system. At least that's what the claim was. And when she first pulled up to the ranch, she noticed these four strange clouds in the sky above. And as it turns out, according to Dr. Howie, UFOs often cloak themselves by looking like clouds. And some people say that the movie Nope was inspired by Stardust Ranch. This is probably why. <laughs> and if you have the eyes in mind to see, as Dr. Howie did, you could see that these four clouds were actually ships that were sent out to support what she was doing. And once she saw them, they briefly decloaked so that she and her colleagues could see them, and then they turned back into their camouflage cloud mode. <laughs> now, once she set foot on the property, she was apparently able to feel all the energy of the place and also the negative energy of the greys. Her and her two colleagues armed themselves with swords. Interesting. So maybe they knew something about how to deal with the aliens, right? Brandy started clearing the house and interestingly she went to the room where the previous owners had a family suicide the high school boy who took his own life on his high school graduation day dr howie confronted the spirit of the boy and supposedly got him to finally move on now the next thing she did was act as a channeler or a conduit to open up a portal to apparently allow some benevolent higher dimensional entities to come into the home to, I guess, help out. John said they were brandishing swords and wearing like medieval armor, which is interesting that, you know, you could actually see them. And he claimed that he, when the portal opened, it looked like this hologram appeared in the room. And that's where the, these higher dimensional entities came out. And, it's unclear. It's not really stated whether or not they they stuck around for a while or if they just left after this whole ordeal. <laughs> now, Brandy then communed with the horses on the ranch, and they apparently told her, or she was able to pick up on their perspective of the aliens torturing and mutilating them, which is a trip, right? And it was made clear that there were these interesting cosmic rules that the aliens had to follow. They were allowed to mess with the pets and kill them and mutilate them. Any kind of pets that they had, horses, dogs, whatever, although they apparently didn't touch the cats. Uh, but part of the, the rules were also that they couldn't kill humans. So John and Joyce were off limits from that kind of level of uh, activity. But they were able to abduct and torment and injure John and Joyce, but they just couldn't kill them, apparently. According to this cosmic law, if these rogue gray aliens were to actually kill John and Joyce or other humans, it apparently would invoke some kind of 
countermeasure from an order of higher dimensional beings who would just come down and essentially beat the crap out of the greys, no problem. <laughs> like John struggled fighting these things supposedly for years using conventional firearms, knives, his fists, and even the samurai sword. And there's still some difficulty, but apparently the greys didn't want any trouble from these other entities. So they would work to demoralize the Edmonds to get them off the ranch eventually. And that was the goal is why they were doing all this to the Edmonds because they believed that the area the ranch was on, especially the portals that were there belonged to them. So after a while, Dr. Howie apparently was able to negotiate I assume telepathically with some of the greys that she sensed that were kind of beyond the veil right on the ranch. And she was telling them that they needed to leave and that this ranch isn't theirs and they're not welcome there anymore. And in that moment, John claimed that as the sun was setting, it was getting late in the day, several alien craft decloaked in the skies above the ranch, one of which was the size of two to three city blocks. And then even crazier is that apparently a mothership flew into this fleet of ships. Like this is straight out of uh, a scene from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. (laughs) And I guess it was like this show of force, like do what we say or else we're going to we're going to mess you up. Now, Dr. Howie was basically ordering the rogue greys to leave the ranch, go reform themselves with, apparently there's like a galactic council or they would suffer the consequences. John says that as he observed her, she was speaking some unknown guttural language that he compared to like the Klingon language from Star Trek. But things weren't going well however, and the alien ships above turned back to clouds, but this time they turned into these like dark storm clouds. Dr. Howie and her two colleagues, the Syrian warriors, circled up and raised their swords, and then when the UFO craft clouds were above and ready to go, they blasted this lightning bolt down to the ground only a few feet away from where Brandy and her two colleagues were standing and the lightning went into Brandy and like came out her head. And when the smoke cleared, there was this blackened three foot wide circle on the ground and Dr. Howie seemed different or off somehow and turned to John and said, I don't think they'll be bothering you anymore. And then promptly left the ranch (laughs) So John waited a few days and then called her. Apparently she had no recollection of the lightning strike, but did say that she was visited by the men in black and told not to tell anyone about what was happening during her visit to Stardust Ranch. And then her colleagues, the two Syrian warrior guys, J and J that were with her had weird things happen to them as well. One apparently got institutionalized for a while And then the other just went off grid and disappeared. Dr. Howie herself also began to experience serious health issues and had massive memory problems. And according to people who knew her, it took her about three to four years to get back to normal after the whole incident on the ranch. Now, according to John, the abductions after this whole ordeal stopped for the most part. There was, however, still a presence of the greys from time to time, but now John had been exposed to the presence of not-asshole aliens, which gave him some sense of hope for the whole situation. And from what it sounds like, the abductions and all of like the torturing and stuff that was going on seemed to stop. One thing I also want to mention here is that if you follow my social media, you probably watched my six-part short video series talking about some of the highlights of this story. Well, after those were posted, somebody reached out to me, and this woman who personally knew John Edmonds and who had stayed at the ranch for some time. And I remembered after watching or listening to one of his interviews that 
He said they had visitors on the ranch from time to time, mostly women, and that the Greys would take a particular interest in them if there were any women staying on the ranch. So this woman tells me that she had brought her camper out there to hang out for a while on the ranch, and she told me that the story behind this place is legit, and the high strangeness, unexplained phenomena, the aliens, everything that the Edmonds claimed about this ranch and had dealt with for two decades actually happened. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. You never know exactly. But apparently one of the days this woman was there, John was working in the yard and she was standing in the doorway of her RV, her camper, and something pushed her out and onto the ground. And mind you, she was solo. She didn't have anyone else with her in the trailer. And John sees her face plant on the ground. And in the doorway, he sees these two gray aliens there who pushed her out. Like, talk about jerks. Like, what the heck, guys? And I'm not sure where in the timeline this happened exactly. But John yelled out, there's aliens in your trailer or something like that. Uh, but I'll probably do some more co- correspondence with her in the future if this uh, person is l- legit and to see if there's any other information I can gather, but it's just definitely interesting. And there's also been other people who have reached out to me who live in the area, probably Buckeye or in Phoenix who have contacted me claiming to have driven by the ranch or gone for a walk down the road that the ranch is on and have seen strange lights or experienced weird things out there but also people who live there say nothing has ever happened out there too. So who knows exactly. Now, one more thing I want to talk about here is that in 2017 or thereabouts after the ghost adventures episode, I believe this woman named Gina irons came forward claiming to have been a former resident of the ranch and she lived there in the early seventies. The article that I found about this with the interview was on a local news website in Phoenix called KPNX. And that's who interviewed her. So basically this Gina irons woman explained that when she and her family moved there, she was a kid at the time and they moved in and it was just a house on 10 acres of desert. There wasn't any other stuff there. It was basically a homestead. She called it the old homestead because it wasn't named Stardust Ranch yet, of course. She said that the previous owners that her family bought from didn't seem sad about selling the place. In fact, they seemed eager to get away from it and apparently left the area entirely in very short fashion after the sale. And they even left their their dog behind on the property which Gina Irons' family happily adopted. Perhaps this was the husband who built the home for his wife who later divorced him after he convinced her to live there even though she hated the place. Although this sounds like it was a couple who was married that sold the place. So maybe the guy remarried or something. Unclear. So over the time that the Irons' family lived there, they wound up adding more structures to the property. They built the barns, the stables, the workshop, property fences, the swimming pool in the back. They really uh, apparently spruced spruced the place up. Now, Gina said that almost immediately after moving in, her family realized that there was something else living on the property with them, some kind of dark force. There's this long hallway in the house, which is pretty dark that leads to the master bedroom, two of the other bedrooms, and then a bathroom in the home. And it was in this hallway that the family frequently spotted this apparition of something. It would appear differently to each member of the family, sometimes in different shapes and colors, usually a shade of green. And whenever this apparition appeared, the temperature in the house would drop dramatically, which sounds like poltergeist activity. Her brother's bedroom, which was off this long, dark hallway, was apparently always ice cold, even in the summer when it was like sweltering hot out and they they had no air conditioners back in the house in the 70s. And Gina and her siblings deduced that her brother's room must have been where the entity lived. Now, I'm wondering if this is potentially connected to 
the young man who committed suicide in his room before the high, his high school graduation. She doesn't state that in, in the interview, but maybe there's a connection there. Thankfully, it seems like the paranormal activity around the home was mostly benign and uneventful, more like a residual haunting to the point that the family got used to it and it didn't really bother them. They kept pretty quiet about their otherworldly roommate, but usually if they had guests over and didn't mention anything, people would get scared if this entity decided to show up. There was this one incident that she recalled where they had a guest over at the house and they were sitting around watching TV in the living room and this guest was sitting on a recliner chair and from the vantage point this chair was in, he could see down the long dark hallway and suddenly he leapt up from the recliner and ran down the hallway yelling that there was an intruder in the house. He then came back frantically and grabbed one of the family's shotguns that they had near the back door and went to the back hallway. I mean, this was like late seventies, early eighties, right? <laughs> so <laughs> probably different, uh, different, uh, values on safety and all that stuff back then. But after a moment, he came back to the living room looking like he had seen a ghost. He was shaking and the hair on his neck and arms were standing up and he quite literally, uh, did see a ghost. According to Gina, the guest said that he swore he saw clear as day, somebody wearing green army fatigues standing in the hallway. And when he ran over there, nobody was there. This apparition just disappeared. Now, by the time the 1980s rolled around, Gina went to college and never went back to the ranch. I assume the family probably sold the property at that point, perhaps to the horse bedding uh, brothel business that had all sorts of trouble surrounding it. However, I, th I think there is a timeline issue here because the current home on the ranch wasn't constructed until 1977, according to the property data that you can easily find. And allegedly by the man who built it for his wife, who hated the place and divorced him shortly after, at least according to the story from the telecom worker that helped to set up the phone system for uh, the Edmonds when they first moved in. And Gina Irons said that they, her family moved into the home in the early 70s and the house was already there. So, you know, it's hard to say who's being truthful, who's making things up. Is this person just trying to get 15 minutes of fame or did the telecom worker <laughs> tell John Edmonds a tall tale? Either way, I thought it was interesting and wanted to include what she had to say about this property. And it suggests that strange activity has been going on at this place for at least 50 years or more. So the conclusion of the whole saga of Stardust Ranch, despite not being able to find a buyer for the ranch, John and Joyce continued to live there for a few more years after trying to sell the place for five million after the Ghost Adventures episode. And they were claiming to still have dealings with the Greys, but also contact with these benign or benevolent extraterrestrials after the experience with Dr. Brandy Howie. And John continued to go on different shows for interviews and then last year in 2022, John Edmonds actually, unfortunately, died unexpectedly. There was a post on his Facebook page in February of 2022 explaining what had happened. From what I gathered, John had surgery for something in late 2021 and was recovering and relearning how to walk. It's not really clear what the surgery was for. Maybe it was back surgery or knee surgery. I'm just speculating here. John also wasn't without other health problems. According to some, to some interviews I listened to, he said that he had diabetes. So I'm not sure if that played a role in any of it. All of the information seems to be private. So probably only Joyce and other family members know what exactly happened. So there was also this attempt to raise money for Joyce as she was still in the ranch and wound up getting behind on mortgage payments. But after the mentions of her never liking the place, I can imagine she probably wanted to leave it all behind. 
And from the property records, it looks like the ranch did change hands at the end of 2022, whether it was a bank repossession or a private sale or something like that isn't clear. Although usually property listings online will say if it's a foreclosure or not. So it was probably a normal sale. And then the property changed hands again this April in 2023. So we'll see if anything ever comes of this place with new owners. Who knows? Wouldn't it be interesting if some government connected person like Robert Bigelow actually wound up buying the place and, uh, to keep it under wraps and out of the public eye, or maybe there's some organization that might set up something for investigations like what Brandon Fugel did for Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, probably not, but time will tell. So what really happened at Stardust Ranch? It's a captivating and thrilling story. However, there are some glaring issues such as why there's no good photos or videos of any of the strange happenings on the ranch. And I'm not even talking about the aliens themselves, but photo evidence of animal mutilations or missing objects reappearing and flying around at John hitting him in the head. <laughs> I would think if you're going to live there for over 20 years on the ranch, that's got poltergeist activity and aliens running amok. You might want to install some security cameras or just something like the men in black and weird characters that show up to the house, UFOs constantly flying above and around the ranch, gray aliens conducting home invasions and abductions every other week. I don't know. The whole thing seems it's a very fantastic tale. And there's a lot of stuff that I can be like, okay, that seems legit. But there's also like the skeptical part of me that's like, yeah, something seems a little fishy with this story. Like I get if you're terrified or you have a lot of irons in the fire with your business and stuff that you don't have time to set this kind of infrastructure up to, to monitor and record like they do on Skinwalker Ranch. I don't know. But then again, I've had people reach out to me and say like what's happening or what has happened out there really did happen. The way the book is written too is not really the best. <laughs> it's a little, little bit sketchy, you know, typos all over the place. And the way he presents it is like, Oh, I can't remember exactly what happened or the order of events. I'll do my best to remember what happened. And it's like, is it a memory or is it just a, a fiction? I don't know. I feel like I'd have a pretty good recollection of this kind of stuff. It, if it was happening constantly, or at least document it in a journal in some way, if you're not going to record or take pictures, maybe that's just me. A lot of people believe this story is just that it's a story. It was a ploy to sell the ranch for a ton of money and it could have become the next skinwalker ranch. Allegedly Robert Bigelow was going to buy it potentially, but that never came to fruition. Like it's a fantastic an interesting story with a ton of detail. Some people think that John may have been schizophrenic. That's not my opinion, but he did have a mental health and counseling background. So if he was unwell, perhaps he had knowledge enough to make it seem like he was with it. Who knows? I suppose people are capable of making up the most outlandish stories to get in the limelight, if only for a little while. I want to believe the story. Like, maybe there is something going on out there. I had read that none of the neighbors in the area have ever really seen anything strange occurring out there. But I have heard from other people, again, who have sent me messages and emails saying otherwise. So it's hard to tell. Perhaps all it is is that the property is haunted by some kind of nefarious trickster spirit. Maybe it's aliens or, or not kind of like what Gina irons described. Ultimately, we'll probably never know for certain what happened out on Stardust ranch, especially with new owners, unless something weird starts happening to them and they come forward. Time will tell. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the show today and for sticking around for the conclusion of the wild, wild saga of Stardust Ranch. Again, I don't know and don't really think most of it's true, 
but it was a fun ride for sure. And I hope that Joyce Edmonds finds peace after the untimely death of John. So rest in peace, John Edmonds. As always, thank you to everyone out there listening, downloading and sharing the show with friends and family. This show wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. It helps me out a ton and I'm always super grateful for you taking the time to hang out and get weird with me. If you liked what you heard today and want to hear more and support the show, I have a whole back catalog of bonus extension episodes called Strangeology Beyond. And these episode extensions can be found over on patreon.com forward slash strangeology if you want to go check it out. Some of these extensions are whole bonus episodes in and of themselves where I dive into another topic, or if I have a guest on for an interview, they hang out for a little while longer for some off the cuff discussion and wherever that discussion may lead us, we have fun with it. There's also other awesome benefits to becoming a member of the Patreon as well, like ad-free episodes, the Strangeology Beyond episode extension, of course, merch discounts, shout outs, exclusive merch. There's a t-shirt of the month club as well. It's an awesome time and a growing community, so definitely check it out. Speaking of shout outs, I want to welcome a few new members to the Patreon. We've got Jeff G, Ayabulela, Laura and Angel. So welcome aboard. We're glad to have you all. And as always, a big shout out to all members. You're all amazing and your support helps keep the lights on here at Strangeology HQ. Thank you all so much. And again, if you want to find out more information, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash Strangeology or check out the show notes for an easy link. And if you're looking for other ways to support Strangeology, make sure to check out my Etsy shop as well if you like Cryptid, Alien, and Fortean merch. The link will be in the show notes also, or you can just type in strangeology.etsy.com in your preferred browser. I've got a bunch of Cryptid, Alien, and Fortean designs on different items like t-shirts, tank tops, long sleeves, sweatshirts, blankets, hats, stickers, pins, magnets, tumblers, mugs, all sorts of stuff. I've had to slow down a little bit on making new designs lately due to scheduling issues, but I do my best to add in new designs as often as I'm able to these days. And also make sure to sign up for my email list as well. I occasionally will send out discount codes and that kind of thing. Also make sure to give me a follow over on all of my social media accounts. I've You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Definitely follow me on Instagram. That's kind of my home base for social media. I'm going to be doing a giveaway soon. I just haven't had a chance to put one together yet, but the show recently passed 200,000 downloads and it's even way beyond that now. So I got to say thanks and do a, a giveaway for everyone. Uh, but as far as the other platforms, I, I post shorter form and longer form video content there and have fun with it. So if you're looking for more content from me in easier to digest forms versus hour long podcast episodes, definitely check it out. And for businesses who are wanting to inquire or collaborate with Strangeology, you can reach out to me at info at strangeology dot com. The same goes if you have a story that you'd like to share, you can reach out to me at that same email address. You can also leave a voicemail on my hotline, which is 802-448-0612 and leave me a message or a couple of messages. I believe the cutoff is two or three minutes. I've been planning on doing another listeners stories episode at some point in the near future, but I need some stories. So send them in again. That's 802-448-0612 for the hotline, or you can email me at info at strangeology.com. I'd love to hear your stories. All right. I think that's all from me for now. I'll be back after a short break for the members only segment, Strangeology Beyond, where I'm going to take a look at a strange location called the Meadow Project. This is known as the Skinwalker Ranch of the South. So until next time, take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange.
right, welcome back, members, to Strangeology Beyond. I hope you all enjoyed the conclusion of the Stardust Ranch saga. And in the same theme as last episode, I wonder.